but welcome. We are glad you're joining us today as we continue our study of the book of Isaiah. Now we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 58 today. And as you know, we are meeting on campus today at 8 o'clock, at 9 o'clock, and 10.30 for our life group ministries. Now I want to encourage you to attend a life group class with us on campus. Now think about this. Isn't it ironic when a friend tells us to drive at the speed limit when we know they rarely do? We give a puzzled look when a relative who rarely helps clean up after a meal directs others to do so. Now to me, the worst case scenario might be this, that, that it might even anger us, that if our neighbor tells us how to mow our grass, yet his yard is at least kept on the block. Now we know hypocrisy when we see it. Yet being hypocritical is one thing humans have in common one way or another. The prophet Isaiah revealed God is always consistent and does not put up with spiritual hypocrisy in his people. Now before we begin this morning, let's pray that God gives us wisdom and an insight as we look into his word and we pray that every Sunday. And we want to continue to pray that God's word is made alive in our lives so that we can share his glory with others. And we want to continue to pray for our country and wisdom for her leaders. Pray for that person that you know that God has put into your life that does not have a relationship with God. Pause your device and take a moment to pray. Well, in chapters 58 to chapter 60, Isaiah seems to address his original audience, Israel, you know, before they were in exile. Now, chapter 58 focuses on why the heart attitude of the people was so important. Now, chapter 59 relates the effects of their sin on their relationship with God. See, God's people were undoing the intended order of things by their words and action. See, everything was twisted, and we see that in chapter 59, verses 14 and 15. But thankfully, this state was not final. See, God will conquer his enemies and redeem those who repent of their sins. We see those in verses 17 through 20 of chapter 59. In Isaiah 59, the image of God as a warrior, along with others from the book of Isaiah, was probably the inspiration for Paul's description of the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 14 through 17. If you think about it, that's what Pastor Stephen is preaching on for the next few weeks. See, in chapter 60, Isaiah described the results of God's redeeming work. The nations will see Israel as God's people and therefore have a chance to repent and worship him. See, one day all eyes will see the true God through his work with his people. But before such a reality could be realized, his people needed to address the hardness of their hearts towards their God. Now today we have with us Bill Tucker, our minister to military, and Ryan Tucker, our minister to college and young adults, to share with us our passages today. And it's good to have both of you with us. So Bill... Share with us from chapter 58, verses 1 through 5, as we continue to look at the book of Isaiah. Have you ever heard the phrase quid pro quo? You might have heard it recently, given all the political activity that's been going on. But uh, Webster's defines quid pro quo as a Latin term, which means something given or received for something else. So essentially something for something. Well, the first few verses of chapter 58, highlight the, uh, the shallow relationship that the Jews had with God at the time. Uh, the Jews were treating God kind of like their neighboring uh, nations had been treating their gods, uh, almost like God was a vending machine. You know, you put a quarter in, you pull a knob, and then you get something, something out. Uh, and so that's not necessarily the way God wants to relate to us. And so he needed to make a point to the people of Israel. Uh, Isaiah, since chapter 40, here in the book of Isaiah, since fo chapter 40, the, the focus has been on the future and hope, and uh, it's, it's primarily focused on the exiles that are in Babylon. But here in chapter 58, we're actually taking a look back again, and the focus is now again on the people of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. And essentially what's, he, what's going on here is God is chastising the people of Judah uh, for how they had been trying to conduct their relationship with God. Uh, let's read uh, verse 1 of chapter 58. It says, cry out loudly, don't hold back. And this is God speaking to Isaiah, telling Isaiah how to interact with the people. He says, cry out loudly, don't hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. 
You know, the word trumpet there is actually the Jewish word uh, shofar. And uh, here's a shofar for you. It's essentially a ram's horn. And uh, this is what was used to get the attention of the Jewish folks uh, for different reasons. Uh, one was obviously to just get their attention to let them know what was going on in the community, but also it could be used to announce danger of some sort. And so God is actually telling Isaiah here, get their attention as loudly as you can. And uh, a lot of times we wouldn't necessarily think of uh, God wanting to do that. You know, we're told that uh, we're not supposed to judge others, and we wouldn't want to make it known uh, you know, that somebody had sin in their life and those types of things. But God is telling Isaiah here, no, get their attention. Uh, and a lot of times our understanding of judging others or getting their attention about sin is based on uh, one small verse in Matthew 7, uh, verse 1, where Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people stop there. And they don't read onward where it says in, in verse 5 and 6 where, where Jesus says, uh, Make sure you take the plank out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So there is that indication that we are supposed to evaluate others' actions and, and let them know if they're out of line. But let's read on to, to verse 2 and see what's going on there. It says, They seek me day after day and delight to know my ways, like a nation that does what is right and does not abandon the justice of their God. They ask me for righteous judgments, and they delight in the nearness of God. And so all this sounds very positive in verse 2, but it's really highly sarcastic language that God is using with Isaiah. Um, what's going on here is the worshipers of God are really just going through the motions, and uh, their hearts weren't really in it. And that's kind of our struggle sometimes, too, is when we, we come to church to worship God or or we live our lives, and we're really just going through the motions, and we're not sincerely worshiping God. Let's move on to Isaiah 58.3, just the first part here. It says, why have we fasted? And this is really the people responding back to God. It says, why have we fasted, but you have not seen? We have denied ourselves, but you haven't noticed. And so here they're making a plea to God, saying, we've done all these things, but yet you don't want to respond to us. It's that quid pro quo kind of mindset, uh, just like their pagan neighbors. See, they wanted something from God, but they didn't really want God himself. And that was, that was the problem. Uh, let's move on to the last little part here. It says uh, in uh, the last half of verse 3 on to verse 5, Look, and this is God speaking to the children of Israel, Look, you do as you please on the day of your fast, and you oppress all your workers you fast with contention and strife to strike viciously with your fist. You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. Will the fast I choose be like this, a day a person to deny himself, to bow his head like a reed and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? So he's, he's trying to ask a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. They weren't performing their worship in the right way, and God wanted to make, make them aware of this. Uh, their, their worship was more external than it was internal. They were going through the motions, and their mistreatment of others was actually an indication of where their hearts really were. Uh, misplaced faith is really... Uh, just unstable guesswork and uh, in the end it really just offends God. Carl? Thank you Bill. Man, we appreciate those insights. Now let's look at chapter 58 verses 6 through 10. Ryan, share these verses with us. So I'm going to read to you chapter um, 58 verses 6 through 10 in Isaiah. So Isaiah 58 6 through 10 says, Is not this the fast that I chose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn 
and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom as the noonday. In this particular section of scripture, God explains the type of fast he wanted from his people. But the description is kind of surprising because it seems to have very little to do with the type of fasting they were accustomed to. The description is of behavior that was the opposite of how the people were living. Instead of oppressing the lower class and the workers, God wanted action from his people. And in verse 6, we see four actions that needed to be taken. We see in the verse 6 that he wanted them to break the chains of wickedness. The idea here is the removal of oppressive behavior. The people fasting could not continue to oppress their workers. Then he, then he says, unite, untie the ropes of the yoke, meaning the less fortunate needed to be treated like equals. Third, he says, those who were fasting had to set the oppressed free. That makes it clear that the oppressed were in this position because of the ones performing the fast. The Israelites who wanted God to hear their petitions must hear the petitions of the ones that they were oppressing. And finally, he tells them to tear off the yoke. And basically what he's saying is they needed to be active in removing, removing the elements that hold people in a persecuted situation. Then we see in verse 7, we see God clarify the purpose of fasting. The Israelites should share their bread with the hungry instead of denying them food. God preferred that his people make sure others have enough to eat. If the people are going to deprive themselves, then they should do so in order to make sure others had enough. And this would reflect God's nature. Additionally, the people were told to bring the poor and homeless into their house. This statement was meant to encourage the people to make sure the poor and the needy had their basic needs met, including shelter. We see time and time again in Scripture that God commands His people to care for the poor. We need to understand that the poor would exist as long as there is a heart problem, but Jesus is the answer to fixing that sin issue. Then lastly, in verses 8 through 10, we see that God is forecasting the magnificent transformation that He would mark Israel if they would change their ways. If the people focused on God by helping others and demonstrating His character in their lives, the blessings they sought would come to them. When these changes took place in their hearts and their attitudes of the people, the Lord would answer them when they call. And then back in verse 1, the people complained that God, that God did not respond when they fasted. But here we see that when the heart issue was cured, God would respond to their prayers and petitions. The people would no longer seek God out of selfish reasoning but rather because they genuinely wanted to fellowship with him and trust that he would deliver them. So instead of showing devotion to God by starving themselves for a time, the people would demonstrate their love for God by alleviating hunger in others. And ultimately, Jesus would be this transforming light. Through his followers, the poor and destitute receive the care that they deserve. Carl? Thank you, Ryan. Let's continue to look at Isaiah 58 as we look at verses 11 through 12. The Bible says the Lord will always lead you, satisfy you in a parched land, and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden and like a spring whose water never runs dry. Some of you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will restore the foundations of long ago. You will be called the repairer of broken walls, the restorer of streets where people live. See, while punishment in the form of exile and destruction would come, this would not be the end. Instead, Isaiah spoke of the guidance of the Lord. In the future, God would always lead his people. They would not need to worry about separation from God again. He would transform a parched land into a watered garden. The image here applies to the people themselves as well as being a reflection of the covenant promises of giving a fruitful land to Abraham. The idea is twofold. First, Instead of being spiritually dead, God's people would be alive and fruitful. Second, 
God will restore that which was lost long ago in the Garden of Eden. See, Adam and Eve were cut off from access to God when they were cast out of the garden. Giving the promised land to the descendants of Abraham was a step toward the restoration of what was lost in the garden. In the Isaiah passage, we see that the God would restore the garden and the promises land, and promised land in the sense that he would provide for the needs of the people and be in fellowship with them. The people, in turn, would provide the fruits of this restoration to the nations. See, this access to God would be everlasting. Water from a spring that never runs dry. And finally, God promised his followers that a remnant would be a part of the process of restoration. The destruction that resulted from the sin of the people would be undone by the faithfulness of the ones that God saves. The foundation of God promises would remain. And it was on these foundations, whether they be the foundations of the temple in Jerusalem or the more metaphorical foundation of the promises of God, that God would restore his people. You know, amazingly, God would work with and through his people to restore what they destroyed. See, the grace of God knows no bounds. So here's the question. How can believers today generally be people who live righteously and not merely look the part? Well, first is that that being, lived, that being and living righteously are the results of having a right relationship with God that's real and personal. And second, maintaining a growing relationship with God requires effort and intentionality. Now third, the Holy Spirit encourages our spirit to draw close to God. It's our responsibility to respond to his, his leading. And last, we must assess the motives of our spiritual practices often. And when we need to make adjustments, we should humbly ask God to change our hearts. So as we close today, prayerfully consider your motives for your religious actions and practices. Ask God to show you, show you the motives that need to be adjusted and for the willingness to accept godly motives. Now, if you would like someone to pray with you or if you, need, if you have a question or if you need to speak with someone, please text 850-366-3080. We have staff members who would love to contact you and speak with you. Now, just be reminded, today's worship service are at 9 o'clock and 1030. You still have time to come and join us in person. Remember, our online services begin at 1030 this morning. Thank you again for joining us for our online Life Group Sunday School class. Have a great week, and God bless you.